this video, we'll be talking about agency and partnership for MEE Highly Tested Issues Guide. The first place I would like to start is discussing the frequency in which agency and partnership as a subject is tested on the MEE portion of your bar exam. Agency and partnership are tested about once a year. Thus, agency and partnership are relatively highly tested. It's also important to note that sometimes agency and partnership are combined, where you'll see an agency and partnership principles tested in one fact pattern. Other times, agency is just tested, and still yet, sometimes partnership is just tested. So there's a lot that examiners can do when it comes to this subject of agency and partnership. Additionally, most of the MEE answers reference law that's generally covered in a business organization's class. Specifically, MEE answers reference the Uniform Partnership Act, the Revised Uniform Partnership Act, or the Restatement Second of Agency. Next, let's turn to the highly tested issues within the subject. Turning first to the subject of agency, the examiners like to test authority. This means both actual and apparent authority. From a common sense perspective, this makes a lot of sense because it would be very challenging to write an agency question that did not touch upon authority. And this is because usually in the fact pattern presented, you have an agent who does something or usually they enter into a contract of sorts. And ultimately the question is if someone else is responsible or liable on that contract. Usually that's someone else that I'm referring to is who we call the principal. Thus, the only way you can answer that type of question is to focus on whether or not the agent had authority to do what they did. And if so, then the principle becomes bound. So always start your essay with an actual authority analysis. Turning to the specifics of actual authority, it can be express or implied. Express actual authority is when the agent is given authority to act for the principal. Implied actual authority is present when the principal's conduct leads the agent to believe that they have authority. This is the idea that maybe there wasn't explicit directions or power given to the agent, but the agent was led to believe that they had the power to do something by virtue of necessity or an emergency set of circumstances or by course of conduct. For example, if your boss tells you to go to a client who's located out of town, uh, maybe to negotiate a deal. You would have the implied authority to book a business trip. Now, if you're assessing whether or not an agent had authority to enter into a contract for their principal and you realize that actual authority doesn't exist, don't stop there. Move on to discuss apparent authority. There are two elements to apparent authority that you want to memorize. The first element is that the person who's dealing with the agent has a reasonable belief in the agent's authority. And the second element is that that belief is being generated or was generated by some sort of action or negligence that can be attributed to the principal. In other words, we need the principal to do something or to fail to do something. Many people forget this second element and sometimes the fact make it very clear or obvious that the principal had made it clear to the third party that they have an agent working on their behalf. So this is your friendly reminder to memorize this rule and do not forget to state those obvious facts. Another highly tested agency issue is vicarious and direct liability. Remember that an agent is always liable for their own torts and principals can become vicariously liable if the agent was acting in the scope of their employment and they made a minor deviation from their employment. There are also some instances in which a principal can become liable for the intentional tort of their agents. This is the case when the intentional tort was committed for the principal's benefit or because the principal authorized it, or it arose naturally due to the nature of employment. For example, let's say a man owned a nightclub and employed bouncers. If the owner told one of his bouncers to punch a patron who was rowdy, then the principal would be liable for that action. The last highly tested issue that I want to discuss in agency is the agent's liability on contracts. The law states that an agent is going to be liable on a contract that they enter into if they did not have actual or apparent authority to do so. The agent is also liable on a contract if the principal is undisclosed to the third party. This means the third party does not know that the agent is working on behalf of someone else. 
Finally, if the principal is partially disclosed, meaning the third party knows that the uh, agent is working on someone else's behalf, but they don't know specifically who that principal is, then both the agent and the principal are liable to the third party. So turning to some highly tested issues in partnership. The first issue that I want to discuss is formation. Partnerships are very easy to form under the law because no paperwork or formalities need to be met. By definition, a partnership is the association of two or more people to carry on as co-owners, a business for profit, whether or not they intended to form a partnership. Thus, based upon this rule, it makes an excellent essay question because there are no formalities. So it's a very factually driven assessment. Specifically, there is no need to sign anything, like an agreement. There is no need to file anything with the state or an agency. And the parties don't even have to know that they have a partnership. So our tip with this issue is to consider starting your rule paragraph with the definition of partnership and then assessing if one existed. Next, let's turn to the highly tested issue of fiduciary duties. Partners are in a fiduciary relationship with one another, and thus, fiduciary duties exist. There are three fiduciary duties to memorize. The duty of loyalty, the duty to account, and the duty of care. The duty of loyalty is that partners should not take corporate opportunities for themselves or engage in self-dealing or to compete with the partnership. The duty to account means that the partners should account for any profit and hold that profit as trustee for the partnership. Finally, the duty of care means that in running the business, they need to act with ordinary care. Turning to the final highly tested issue that I will touch upon today is that of a partnership ending. There are three ways to end a partnership. The death of a partner, the end of a definite term or completion of an undertaking, and a partner's withdrawal. Withdrawal or disassociation is the most highly tested method. When a partner disassociates, dissolution occurs, unless the remaining partners agree to rescind dissolution. Dissolution is not the end of a partnership, but instead it triggers the winding up of the partnership's business affairs. This means the assets are liquidated and creditors get paid. Then the partnership ends or terminates. You will note that the guide also touches upon the issue of LLPs and LPs. We will not discuss this in detail, but be sure to review the guide for some more information on this point. Next, our tip is that you should familiarize yourself with key agency and partnership vocabulary. When we review essays, we frequently find that if an examinee fails to articulate certain words or to use certain vocabulary, their score usually suffers. For example, this has happened in the past with the word ratification. If you're unfamiliar with ratification, it's a situation where the principal can become liable for an agent's action, even if the agent lacked authority. In order for ratification to be present, the principal must know of the material facts and have the capacity to ratify the transaction. Further, the principal must affirm or accept the benefit of that transaction. If this happens, then the principal becomes bound. We've read exam answers where the examinee describes ratification, but they don't use that precise word. Then we've read answers where the examinee uses the correct vocabulary, and in comparing those two examinee scores, it's obvious that knowing the right word to use will positively impact the examinee score. Thus, we urge you to review key vocab terms and then utilize them in your essay practice. Our final tip for the subject of agency and partnership is to practice. Practicing essays will ensure that you know how to properly apply the law to the facts, and it'll give you exposure to how the examiners like to test these issues. Overall, it will make you more confident walking into your exam. So that wraps up our video on agency and partnership as part of our highly tested issues MEE guide.